environmental devastation. We are actually witnessing what we all feared would happen. I am old enough today to be able to say to you that when we began the discussions on climate change in the early 90s, and I was at the first conference that happened in Geneva to discuss a possible agreement to contain and control climate change. That was in 1991. Most of you would not have even been born then. And at that time, the world believed that climate change was so far in the future, but still there was an effort to do something about it. Today, it's 2016. The future is here. We are seeing it happen today. Be very clear. All of you read papers. All of you listen to the newspaper, uh, to television. Unfortunately, and I'm saying it to my two best friends who are sitting here from the media, their media doesn't cover these issues as loudly as I would like them to do so. Okay? But for all of us who live this, we know that these changes are happening. Just think what has happened the last three days. I come from Delhi. My city of Delhi did not have any winter this winter. No winter. Now, Western disturbance is not a new phenomenon. Most of you, your teachers will tell you, you study it. Western disturbance, it brings with it such intense rainfall that it absolutely cripples the farmer. You and I are privileged. When the, when the rains come, we can shut our windows. We don't feel the impact of the changing weather. As people who have never contributed to the problem of climate change, they are the ones who are suffering today. Some months ago, um, a very major Hollywood star had come to India to interview me, Leonardo DiCaprio. When he came, one of the questions he was asking me was, what is the impact of climate change and why is it that you are always talking about the issue of climate justice? What is climate justice? What is this impact of climate change? And what are you worried about? One and a half hours from Delhi, one and a half hours from Delhi, less than an hour away from the city of Gurgaon. And all of you must have seen the big, big buildings of Gurgaon. One hour away from Gurgaon was a little village in the district of Mewat near Nu, where I took Leonardo. Why? Because in this village, here were farmers who told us that for two years, they had now seen such variable weather, such extreme weather, that it was breaking their back. So I went with him on the first week of October. Last week of, if I remember right, last week of September, first week of October, some, something like that. 15th of September, they had had a rainfall, which was in eight hours, they got something like 300 millimeters of rainfall in eight hours. Here is a district which on an average in a whole year gets as little as 500 millimeters of rainfall in a whole year. 
And yet, in just eight hours, they got 300 millimeters. When we went there, and I'm sorry, it wasn't the end of September, it was the end of October, when I went there, the entire fields for miles were underwater. And what they told us was that in the previous crop, which was the rubby crop, the winter crop, their crop was standing, ready for harvesting, and then came exactly as it has now, the hailstorm which, which destroyed their crop. Last March, they picked themselves up again, they took debt from the money lenders again, they bought the seeds again, they decided not to give up, they decided to replant. And they replanted, and look what happened in September, when the standing crop was there. I could not even tell them that don't give up. How can you tell people who literally are being forced to pick themselves up from nothing again and again? How can any one of us say, don't give up? What is amazing is that they did not give up. They did not tell us at even one time that they were ready to give up. They were in fact looking now at what new crops can they grow which could be more weather tolerant. And this amazing farmer called Hajiji, whose house I took Leonardo to, who my colleagues who are journalists who had been interviewing him and had been writing about this event for some time, Hajiji has started growing castor because castor is a more hardier plant. And his hope is that that is what will help him to cope with this changing weather. That is resilience. That is what people are doing on the ground. But the question we have to ask is, today, the immorality of climate change is that people who are not responsible, their consumption has not created the problem of climate change. Climate change, as all of you know, is directly responsible, for, is directly related to the use of fossil fuels. It is the major source of emissions comes from the use of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels, as you know, is either used for making energy, which is then used to light up our homes, it is used for transportation. It is used for industry. That is the bulk of the emissions which are today up in the atmosphere. And the reason they're in the atmosphere is that carbon dioxide has a very long life. So it's also a particularly difficult pollutant. Most of you live in Calcutta. How many of you live in Calcutta? Okay, all of you live in Calcutta, almost. You breathe very bad air. I can say that with great certainty. I breathe even worse air. I come from Delhi. My air quality is worse than yours. So one of these days, we are all going to have a competition in which we are all going to compete on who has the worst air. And the worst air city is going to get the best prize. Because the way we're going, it's all going to turn around and we're going to say, I have the worst air in, the, in this country. But you have bad air as well. I can tell you that. My nose is what I call a sanitary inspector. So I can, you can put a blindfold on my eyes and if you walk me around, I can tell you, this is diesel, this is kerosene, this is very bad air. So I can pretty much tell you that your air is pretty foul. Now, that pollutant which makes the air foul in our cities, which is very toxic for us, it is bad for our health. Because there is enough research that has happened today that shows us how bad the air 
is in our cities and what it does to our health. In fact, one of the best studies that has been done has been done for the city of Delhi by the Chitranjan um, Cancer Research Institute, which is based in Kolkata, which did a study for Delhi where they looked at the lungs of children. And they looked at how were the lungs of children who live in Delhi impacted and compared it to children who did not live in very polluted areas to children who lived in more polluted areas. And their study showed in Delhi, and this is a frightening statistic, and I don't see a study like that for Kolkata, but I'm sure if it's done, it would be equally frightening, that one in every third child had their lung capacity was seriously damaged. Now remember, if you're at your age, if your lungs are damaged, as you get older, it only gets worse. And that's unacceptable. It's completely unacceptable. But that's what this study found in Delhi. But the point I was making is that that air pollution is extremely bad. It is poisonous, it is toxic, and it is something we have to control. But it is still different from carbon dioxide. The difference is that when that car emits particulate matter, which is the key pollutant in our cities today, PM or PM 2.5 as it is often called because the size of the particulates is so small that it goes through our nose. And as I keep saying, when God made our noses, he didn't think of diesel. So our nose has a very nice filter, which is uh, the hair in our nose. But that hair in our nose doesn't, has not been planned for diesel. And none of you should tell me that Darwin's theory is going to work here and that your nose will evolve now so that it will plan for diesel, okay? Because nobody's body evolves for pollution. It is only toxic for us. But... That particulate matter in the atmosphere has a short life. So it's bad for us, has to be controlled, but has a short life. On the other hand, carbon dioxide has an extremely long life, 150 years. Now this is what makes the issue of climate change so difficult. Because there are countries in the world which have got rich, by emitting large amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which they needed for their progress, today the atmosphere is filled with that. And there is absolutely no space for the rest to grow. And already the impacts are showing on people who have not even contributed to the, to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I'll give you some broad numbers just because I think it's important because people are very intelligent, very bright. So you need to get that broad picture. So think about the atmosphere as this bowl. Now the total amount of capacity, if you want to keep the world below 2 degrees centigrade. Now why 2 degrees centigrade? Because we are already at 0.8 degree increase in temperature. 0.8 degrees is also inevitable because of the atmosphere, because of the amount of gases which are in the atmosphere, which will force that temperature to happen, increase to happen. So, but two degrees is what scientists say will be dangerous, but will not be a catastrophe. Now, I also believe they say two degrees because they know they cannot do less than that. And they also say two degrees because the impacts till the world gets to two degrees is going to be on the poor of the world. Beyond two degrees will be on the rich of the world as well. But still, if you want to keep the temperature increase to two degrees, that's all you want to say from 1850 to 2100, that's the, that's the range you have of years. You want to say till then, temperature rise only two degrees. So again, I'm not going to pick it up. My hands are not so good. And 
maybe they're not so bad. So this is the atmosphere. Just think about it. Now the total amount of carbon dioxide that this can be filled up with is 2,900 billion tons. That's the limit to keep it below two degrees. Now that would be a good, that would be a good number if I didn't tell you that 1,900 billion tons is already eaten up, is already over. Do you see this water line? This water line is your carbon dioxide line. That's already over. So 1,900 billion tons has already been emitted into the atmosphere. And as carbon dioxide has a long life, it's there still. So even if it was emitted 150 years old, when the country was just about to begin industrialization, country like the United States, that carbon dioxide is still present in that atmosphere. And 1,900 billion tons is already gone. To keep the world to two degrees, you have only a thousand left. And by 2020, the rich part of the world would have used up the bulk of that thousand also. Around 500 would also finish. This is what is called climate injustice. This is what a number of people in this room who I can recognize, have been raising their voice against and saying, this is not acceptable. Because everybody in the world has the right to development. But what is also very clear is that if you want to keep the world safe, then everybody in the rich world, all the rich in the world, all the people who are getting rich in the world, will all have to reinvent what we mean by growth and progress. We cannot pollute and then clean up. That cannot happen anymore. It means that the rich part of the world, countries like the United States, which in my view are still completely, I'm looking for a polite word, um, are countries which seriously need to do something to reduce their emissions. And what they have put on the table still is business as usual. President Obama's clean coal action plan or clean power plan is not worth the paper it is written on. Because the United States will continue to emit more, it will continue to drive more, it continues not to use public transport, it will build bigger homes, it will use more energy. Now, the problem that we all have is that all of us aspire to be an American, either live in America or have an American lifestyle. And that the world is clearly saying, as I began saying, enough is enough. There is no way that this atmosphere can remain at 2,900 billion tons, which is what all you can fill up over here if all of us do not reinvent what we do. The rich have to do it first, and as they do it, we have to be able to reinvent the practice so that everybody can follow. Because what you have today is massive impacts on the poorest of the world, particularly the poorest in India. And every time I read the newspaper and I see the news now that the weather has been erratic, variable, extreme, I am struck with enormous guilt. I feel so strongly that we should be so much more angry at the fact that the poor in the world today are being impacted because of our consumption. 
because it is very clear today that climate change is leading to more and more variable weather events, more and more extreme rainfall events. And you have to know that Mr. Arun Jaitley is not the finance minister of India. The monsoon is the finance minister of India. And if the monsoon is the finance minister, then be very clear, the finances of the very poor in the world are being very seriously jeopardized. They are being crippled. And we have to believe that we have to bring change. Now, this is really what excited me when I walked in and people talked about all the different practices that are happening and all the different ways in each one of you are beginning to reinvent what it would mean to be green, to, be, to change your own lifestyle, to do things differently. Um, CSC, the organization I work with, has, um, has something called the Green Schools Program. And with so many schools present here, I'd, I'd very much, I'd like to introduce this program to you. And any information you require further, I'd be more than happy to share with my friends from Caritas and, and others over here to see what we can do to collaborate further. But what that program does is to essentially get every school to map first what is your own environmental footprint. So you look at your water, you look at your waste, you look at your air pollution footprint, you look at your um, energy footprint, and how do you do that? Let me give you a simple example of what you would do in the case of waste. Now, we all know that if you want to deal with the mountains of garbage in our cities, the only way to deal with those mountains of garbage is to do two things. One, minimize how much we produce, and two, segregate what we produce. And once you segregate what you produce, try and compost or reuse what is biodegradable and what is not biodegradable, recycle. So you make sure that you take your waste and you make it a resource rather than waste to waste. That's the only way we can clean up India. So if any one of us believes that Swachh Bharat is important, then this is the way to practice Swachh Bharat. Uh, that's what each one of your schools has to do. Each school has to be able to measure the waste that comes in. You need to be able to put yourself a goal to say, how much of that waste will you minimize first? How much will you make sure will not happen in the next year? And then as you set those goals, you have to be able to segregate the waste, which I'm sure many of you are already doing. You need to do that, and you need to make sure that every other part of it is recycled. And that's really the practice which needs to begin at, in our homes, in our schools, in the way we do things, which then can be taken up. And that's really also where this conference, which has been looking at the issue of ultimate energy, plays a very, very important role in tomorrow's future. Because as I said, it is energy which is actually at the root of the climate change problem. But it is energy which also can be the solution to climate change. Because today there are such large numbers of people in our world, in India, who do not have even basic energy. They do not have lights in their homes. They do not have clean cooking fuel. So today, most women use still biomass to cook food, which adds to their health burden. And it is also very clear that most of us who are today using fossil fuel need to find new solutions as well. Now, this is where the energy transition is the most exciting thing that could happen in our world. 
we could see that transition actually happen. We are seeing so many different ways in which we are beginning to do things differently. I mean, did any one of you ever think about the fact that today, all of you take, and I hope not many of you probably don't and you shouldn't, but most of us do, which is the cell phone, the mobile phone for granted. A few years ago, none of us had a mobile phone. And yet today, you can't do without it. Today, so much of business is changing so that we are beginning to do things differently, whether it is Uber or Amazon or all the other businesses that are happening. But the biggest game changer that needs to happen, the biggest change in business that needs to happen is in the business of energy. That is still held by dinosaur companies which generate energy and then supply it to households across. Today, with the mobile phone, you have cut the landline. You don't think of the landline anymore. But why is it that when we think about energy, you still think of the grid? The huge reinvention that can happen in our own world is when we can make sure that we become, each one of us becomes a solar power generator. We need to generate the energy. We need to use it in our homes. That's what the huge rooftop solar revolution that happened in Germany, and I know somebody talked about it in the session before. And that is something that the government today has launched, the government of India has launched, a massive rooftop solar program. We need to make sure that that can happen, that it doesn't remain words only, that it actually gets practice. Because it is also very clear that we, the middle classes of India, we are the biggest consumers of energy. We should pay the price for energy. So if solar is more expensive today, it is we who must take the first burden of that transition we should be installing it because also remember when energy is more expensive, we will also be much more frugal in how we use it. Because it is not about how much you generate, but how little you use. And that really will come as we begin to use that source of energy and we can find ways of replicating it so that literally every village of India has a, a, a decentralized source of energy. There is no reason why it shouldn't happen. I learned this when I traveled to Sundarbans and I saw some very exciting work that was happening in West Bengal. I then went to Chhattisgarh and I saw some very interesting work happening in Chhattisgarh. And it is very clear that's what the future is all about because you can have very massive power plants. They can even be based on solar energy, but if that power from those massive power plants doesn't reach the homes of people and is not affordable by the poor people of this country, they will continue to live in darkness. And if expensive solar does not become cheap enough, then we will still depend on coal energy to power and energize our homes. That's what needs to change. That's the big future. That's the, that, that should excite us as well because we then would be part of a massive change in the world. Because remember, the internal combustion engine and the burning of fossil fuel was an idea that happened 200 years ago. It is time that we actually found the new way in which we can have well-being, we can even have wealth, but without pollution, without destroying the very planet on which we live. And we need to make sure that we have that lifestyle so that we can share that planet with everybody. We cannot be another America. A selfish country which is ready to destroy the lives 
of such large numbers of people in the world, but says its own lifestyle is not negotiable. Your and my lifestyle has to be negotiable because we have to speak to say that we care about the entire world, not just ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. And I'm sure everyone in this audience really appreciates your inputs and I think they are... Uh, uh, did you like ma'am's speech? But your applause didn't reflect that. So can you really show her how much you appreciate the speech? Thank you. Thank you. Well, now we're going to have an open house chaired by ma'am. And uh, we'll ask for some more chairs to be uh, put up. And we have an eminent panel who's going to sit here and answer any questions that you have, especially from our young friends here. Because this is your world and this is what you are going to inherit. It is your future. We are here just to help, aid, assist, abet. It's your world. You have to deal with these issues. So, Ma'am Sunita Narayan will chair. May I request Dr. S.P. Gon Choudhury to kindly come up and take his place on the desk. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please welcome Mr. Dr. S.P. Gon Choudhury. He is popularly known as the Solar Man of India. I think all of them can uh, sit. Uh. May I now request Mr. Lars Ban, the UNICEF Director for Disaster Risk Reduction, to kindly join the panel. I would also request Mr. Vincent Moller from Germany to please come and be part of this panel. Mr. Rod Lober, please could you come? Mr. Janto Basu, Environment uh, Correspondent for the Telegraph, is he here? Janto Da. Welcome back. He was here with us yesterday. Please welcome Jayanto Basu. So, ma'am, this is an open house to be chaired by you. So, I'm sure questions. Nobody has any questions. Oh, very well behaved people. <laughs> Either they've uh, perfectly understood everything you said or they've understood nothing, nothing. at all. Yeah, I have a feeling they understood nothing. And they Come on, like what who's I the first student? Okay, please introduce yourself, tell us the name of your school and go for it. My name is Miraj Ahmed Siddiqui. I come from the Assembly of Gotcha School. I want to ask you this question that is there a point after which increase in CO2 level will not cause further global warming. <laughs> Who would like to answer? I mean, it's a simple answer, no. I mean, the only thing is that there is a point when you will have so much CO2 and the temperatures would have increased to such a point that none of us will live. We will have all died. Because unless somebody comes up with a brilliant answer on how they can take the carbon dioxide which is in the atmosphere and turn it into something which is not harmful, which is a possibility because after all, a lot has been done in the world. Otherwise, the fact is that as you pump more and more carbon dioxide... I mean, I, I have some friends and they like to play this game actually. They are saying that actually... We have been polluting so much, so the best is we should have more wars and in the end we will be less people, so there will be less pollution in the end we can live. No, actually, we, it, it has been very rightly said. I mean, basically, it's, it's really a, a very basic decision. Which kind of development do we want to go? And we have seen the way of what development has been going is not the right path. We really have to change completely. 
Um, so in that sense, I mean, basically, we all here in this room and outside, we all have to change fundamentally. And it's a big, big challenge. Um, it has been said, and I'm so happy speaking here for UNICEF, that so many children and, and youth adolescents are here because, I mean, UNICEF, you all know, is the agency of the UN working for children. And I must confess, um, sorry if I monopolize a little bit, um, because actually UNICEF has been a bit of late comer to the climate change agenda. It, there has been so many other issues. We are looking into education, we are looking into health, we are looking into water and sanitation. We are looking into, I mean, here in India very much on open defecation, of course, nutrition, health, education, these aspects. So we always thought, and we had resources for it, we can get away with climate change. It's happening, and of course, there's other agencies who take part of it. But this has fundamentally changed for our organization, and we actually want to team up with you, with the youth. We are doing it already. I represent here um, an institution, I mean, a section, we are working on disaster risk reduction. It's also an innovative for UNICEF. We don't have this in many countries. But in India, we have it because we see that we have to adapt to this climate change which is happening here, and we have to work on the mitigation. We want to work now on the air pollution. It was said by Dadan. I mean, at least I'm pretty new to India, but what my colleagues told me that now for the first time this winter, there was much of debate on the air pollution issue. Because indeed, I mean, there are some aspects that are particularly linked to you, where you are much more vulnerable actually to the effects of air pollution, for example, be it indoor or outdoor pollution. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, we go. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, just a sub, uh, just a just one more uh, just announcement uh, uh, we have you give it okay we uh, we did not announce this earlier but you got a t-shirt right so if you ask the right question you could end up with a t-shirt so i think that should be incentive to ask more questions okay put your hands together for the first que uh, question it takes guts to be the first one I'm Radhu Shiroi from St. Xavier's Collegiate School. And my question is, we have lots of international treaties which are being signed at the moment, starting from the Kyoto Protocol in 1997. But the point is that major countries, such as the United States of America, did not ratify the treaty. Canada withdrew from the treaty later on. If we consider the Paris Summit today, most of the clauses which deal with uh, financing uh, by the developed countries to the developing countries, those are in the non-binding parts of the treaty. And there's no sanctions whatsoever if you consider the Paris Treaty on countries which do not follow on on their action plans. So if the international treaties dealing with environmental concerns are so lax and the powers, the main developed countries don't have any incentive to follow them, don't have any binding nature to follow them, so how will environmental concerns be addressed? Because the developing countries will then feel that we also don't need to follow these guidelines because we're not being helped by the developed countries. And that's very difficult for the developing countries when they need to industrialize as well. So how will this uh, cycle be broken uh, with the inactivity of the international treaties in our country at the moment? Brilliant. I think, you know, you have really hit the nail on the head. That is, when I came back from Paris this year, and when there was a whole lot of people who testified to it, I was so angry, so depressed. I wrote, I think, my most angry editorial after a long time, exactly for the reason that you have said. Because two things have happened in Paris. One, we have not asked for any binding nature on countries to say that they will actually follow through on the action plan that they have said. The action plan itself is weak. But at least we should have said that you have to have a binding agreement on those countries that they will have to follow on it. Now, already in the U.S., the Supreme Court has struck down 
the clean power plan of President Obama. As I said, that plan itself was pathetic. But now that it has been struck down, it gives that country even more reason to do even less than it did before. So that is one major challenge that happened in Paris. It also means that countries like India, which have put together a reasonably good action plan, our uh, national targets that we have put in comparison, if you look at it, are not bad. But what is the mechanism that each one of us will be held to account to make sure that we do follow through on what we have said will happen? And two, what Paris has not done. So on one hand, it does not have a mechanism to hold the rich responsible, any country responsible. On the other hand, it has not asked for aggressive ramping up of action. And I think that's really what we need to make clear and say very clearly that this is why we believe Paris is not a success. When I said Paris was not a success, a lot of people were very angry with me because they said, no, 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 Paris is a great success. You've had the United States come up there. You've had every country agree. And my point was exactly what you said. There are no binding agreement in Paris. It is inequitable. It is unambitious. And so we have to demand a Paris plus agreement. We cannot accept Paris as the last agreement. And that has to be the fight for the future. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Vedant Kixeria. I am from Sint Davis as well. Ma'am, my question is, ma'am, uh, you are reading. Here it says there are 200 schools who got all 10 kilowatt rooftop solar power plants and they are using electricity from solar and that uh, has been funded by the government. And a number of institutions, Government of India, they do give 30% subsidy. Day before yesterday, uh, Secretary MNRE was here. And you know, I have developed a microsolar dome for the very poor people, first time in the country. At that time, you know, that was 100% subsidy. But think, now we have got in India 5,000 megawatt of solar. Some way, government has given either they have given evacuation facility or, or they have given some, you know, tariff, feed-in tariff facility or something like that, or net metering facility. Subsidy doesn't mean just a capital subsidy. You know, if you put a solar system in your home, then your electricity bill is coming down, isn't it? Now, suppose you are a rich person. Of course, you are reading the big school. At least you are a good family, you know. At least your income is good. So you are maybe you may be in the higher slab. Now, you are drawing, say, 500 units of energy. Try to understand. It's a pure technical thing. Now, if you put a solar system, then you push into the grid 300 units. So you are coming to 200 units slab. And your tariff will come from 8 rupees to 5 rupees. So that is the subsidy. Nobody can understand. You are coming from 8 rupees to 5 rupees and government is allowing that yes, you push power into the grid and you may come down to the lower slab. So this is called indirect subsidy. So there are those who are paying income tax. They get depreciation benefit. That is also subsidy. So that is how the country from 100 watt, which I started, now from 100 watt to kilowatt, then megawatt, and then gigawatt. And you know our target is now 100,000 megawatt. That is 100 gigawatt. So we have gone up to gigawatt level. So you have to understand the solar sector. There are subsidy, but I always agree, if government gives more subsidy, it is better, but not always better. You know, Many people misuse subsidy also. So if it is a market-driven program, then it is best. And indirect subsidy is good. But the country is doing well. We have a target of 100,000 megawatt. Maybe I don't know whether we'll achieve 100,000 megawatt, but I'm sure at least 60 to 70 percent uh, target we will achieve. And for which there are a lot of indirect benefit incentives scheme both in the state and also in the central government. Okay? Yes. Um, 
maybe I can add quickly to that, that uh, one of the other countries you mentioned, is Germany, for example, the whole energy transition is also without so-called subsidies. It's just not net metering, but feed-in tariff systems. So I just wanted to uh, add to that. And it took the first, when these policies have been implemented, which just give a stable framework for investments, there's no subsidy on the initial capital investment. But the first 10 years, not really anything happened. So sometimes it just takes some time also for these policies to have a big effect on, on the country because the industry, the, so the companies, etc., they all have to adjust to that. And um, so you will see some effects, I think, especially the net metering will, will be a big thing, I think, uh, in India. You know, this um, one very interesting thing that Ronit has done. They've increased the coal sets. So there's a sets now on every ton of coal that is used in India, and that's up to 400 rupees per ton of coal. That means 24,000 crore is generated every year today from the coal sets. Now, my slight disagreement with Dr. Gon Chaudhary is that I think I, if I was the government of India, my argument would be take that money and put it massively, massively into solar as well as improving our thermal power plants. We are still not doing enough of it. If you look at Germany, Germany's massive solar revolution happened when they had, they were paying their consumers 50 euro cents per unit. 50 euro cents per unit. That is equivalent to 30 rupees a unit in Indian rupees. Today you're down to 10 euro cents per unit. And today Germany customers are not putting solar roofs as much as they were when they were getting 50 cents per unit. So it's also very clear that you will need to push this source of energy more aggressively. We cannot just say now it has grid parity and we solar is equivalent to coal and we can now. So the government of India this year is taking money from what is called the Clean Environment Fund and putting it to save tigers. Saving tigers is very important, but I would argue that lighting up India's homes with clean power is even more important. So I agree with you that I think we need much more open regimes and much more incentives so that we can actually move towards solar power much faster. One very uh, She is right uh, that NCF fund is there. That is called NCF, National Clean Energy Cell. Huh? No, coal cells fund, okay. That fund is there and there is a lot of accumulation. But if you are innovating and submit a proposal, we have submitted a proposal from West Bengal, which is a very, very innovative proposal, converting your Purulia pump storage scheme, 1000 megawatt, which is pumping water during daytime by uh, through coal power and during nighttime we are generating from hydro. We are now, we have suggested that we'll pump water from solar during daytime. It's a huge plan, you know. 6,000 crore subsidy we are going to get in the state. This is a project of 16,000 crore, and that 6,000 crore is coming from the Clean Energy Fund. So this type of, it should be, it is written that it should be very, very innovative. Then you can, I would request you, the students, do research, go with innovative proposal. Definitely, you know, West Bengal or other states will get fund from NCF. At present, it is really, you know, that. That is a very big accumulation. Okay, we will not give you such long answers from now. So let's move from this table to another table. I think we need the table at the back. Good afternoon. My name is Akash Tipnipal from SMB of Gorchard School. We as students want to do something. Like what we read in our books is not something we actually do. And plastics has been banned, but we won't follow about this. There's a man, a taxi driver. His name is Dhananjay Chakraborty. He has replaced his car ACs with a grass bed on his car's roof, tab's roof. So why can't we pass some laws like uh, we should do something innovative like Sir said. So uh, if all car taxis and car cabs, uh, also online uh, Ola's and Uber, to replace their car ACs with a grass bed on their car roof, we can pass this law, right? Yeah, sir. 
you answer it, you will know this better. You're basically saying that the utility of the innovative factor is more than two years. Uh, I think what I understood the question that you were basically saying that uh, there need to be laws to kind of put the uh, kind of preaching into practice. Yes, I, come, I, I agree with you. I agree with you that when you are having a target as high as 100 uh, gigawatt in 2022, then you need to have a law. And I was looking at the figures of uh, PMO office on the solar installation in India. I, I found that uh, from 2015 to 2016, there had been an increase of 130% from about 2,200 uh, to 5,100 kind of. That's, that's right, Dr. Konshul? Now, that is not good enough. If you have the target of 100 uh, gigawatt by 2022, that's not good enough. So you need to have laws. And if you look at the figures, the state-wise figures, there has been huge disparity. For example, I can, I can talk about West Bengal. West Bengal has been one of the front runners I would say pioneer in grid connected solar, I think about two, two megawatt in the Shirgaon. And in last one year, West Bengal's increase has been less than 5%, when many of the states are having 300, 400% increase. So I completely agree with you. Down the line, there should be clear cut laws to enforce this preaching into practice. Having said that, also it needs to be admitted and acknowledged that many of the municipalities, municipal corporations, uh, they are coming up with certain guidelines, not necessarily laws in that way. There are certain guidelines in the in the housing policy, uh, likewise. But uh, I think it needs to be stronger, and otherwise uh, we will not be able to achieve the goal that we have set for ourselves. Uh, Dr. Well, uh, is it possible that climate change is not being dealt with on a global scale because some people are actually benefiting from it? For example, if there's a very cold place where almost nothing grows, and then because of climate change, it starts experiencing a warmer weather, which allows it to grow a wider variety of crops, which actually increases the capital. And so why would such a country want to invest in something like an environment issue when Working on it will actually make them spend more money and reduce the yields. Brilliant question. I think that's really at the core. Who is going to answer it from one of the cold countries? <laughs> you can also add. So um, I'm coming from Germany, from north of Germany, and we terribly miss our winters actually. So we're not so happy that it's warmer now. And, um, I think even the cold countries there, they could grow more. You're right about it. There would be some, some more growth. But um, I think even the industry um, and the, the, the agriculture is oriented to, to what, what what has been before with the cold climate. So there will also be some adaptation in that sense and would what need some time. Um, Your question is very valid. But that is only up to a certain temperature increase. And I think that's what people need to understand in the cold countries who think today that they will benefit. Uh, just think about the irony of the situation. Today, the Arctic is going to melt. And they're talking about the fact that the Arctic ice cap would melt to a point where ships will be able to go over the Arctic. So you can now have a whole generation of new ships that are coming up because as the Arctic opens up, remember, that's where they are expecting to find a huge amount of oil and gas reserves. So they are looking now to see how they can benefit from a warmer, increasingly warmer planet. And yes, there are parts of the world which are looking to see that yes, our temperatures are getting warmer, we'll be able to do better agriculture, why should we spend? So your question is valid, but that is only up to a certain temperature increase. Because you think about what's happened in the US this last winter. They've had massive snowstorms, massive. They've also been hit by the worst drought. Look at Australia. So they are beginning to learn <laughs> that as temperature increases, 
even they will be very badly impacted. Now, there is no doubt that if you are rich, you always believe you are more protected. You can use bottled water, you can switch off the AC, you can protect yourself from floods, you are not the worst affected by drought, but that's only up to a point. Even the rich in the world are, going, are beginning to see the writing on the wall that they will not be, they cannot survive this winter. So I think that's where the world is coming together to say that rich or poor, tropical or temperate, we will have to cooperate. Because the other lesson from climate change is that if we don't cooperate, we will never be able to deal with it. Because if India continues to pollute, then even if Germany reduces, it will have no impact. So we need cooperation. For that, you need fairness. Okay. Yeah, it's a very good question. You know, the climate change has created a lot of opportunities also. You know, the entire country has about 50,000 solar technicians. You can't think of it. And there is a target to create about one lakh more Surya Mitra. They are all getting opportunities because we have a target of one lakh Mitra. You know, that is creating a green job. So you will be getting, when you will be in the masters or in the university, you will be getting a getting lot of areas where you can do research. Climate change is also giving those challenges to you. So, you know, it's a, it's a disaster, I agree. But at the same time, it is opening a new avenues, you know, for the job seekers, green job, for the researchers, for the industries, green industries. These are all opening. This is a different section. But That's fine. But I still will... The young gentleman here in the front. Maybe. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Shohil Iqbal, and I am from St. Mary's School. Ma'am, my question is that uh, the rural population of developing countries like uh, India generate pop, uh, pop, uh, pollution, ma'am. But we are uh, we are only constituting our uh, aim at developing the the urban classes, ma'am. The most of the pollution in India comes from the fuel. Most of the pollution in India comes from the uh, chulhas that we use in villages. But uh, our con uh, we are we are uh, we are aiming, ma'am, to de develop the or uh, develop the urban classes, ma'am. We are not. Uh, we we should like install solar panels or uh, in the villages instead of. Uh, I heard, uh, I wrote, ma'am, that the government is spending huge amount of money in installing some uh, wind power, that uh, wind energy, uh, what is, wind energy plant something. So it's going to take a lot of amount of land and money, which we can sp uh, spend on the ruler classes and install solar panels in their houses that it, it will save money also and it will save the pollution also. Uh, apart from solar power, what are the other forms? Uh, uh, what are the other forms of eco-friendly energy sources which can be used in cities? Most in cities, right? More questions, please. Government panel, Madam Singh, I would like to ask you. Uh, as we all know that in uh, India. Our uh, respective prime minister has introduced the odd even um, uh, method uh, to reduce the air pollution, which is being developed in Delhi. So I would like to know what are the other measures or suggestions you have for reducing this air pollution. And one more one is that, uh, do you ag uh, agree that we should uh, stop using diesel cars? If you agree so, then we should reduce the, uh, then the government should have more laws or methods to reduce the petrol prices, which is uh, which is much higher than diesel prices, which uh, which would help the uh, uh, poor people like uh, the commercial users, those who have diesel cars, 
to reduce their petrol uh, to, to reduce their uh, monthly uh, uh, part they have they spend thank you next one um ma'am yes did it Okay, ma'am, I'm Rashi Singhi from the Reto House, and uh, my question is open to the panel itself. And uh, I really wanted to ask that how do we, as students and citizens of a developing country, compensate for all the losses which we've already made to the environment since we've almost crossed the CO2 level uh, from a very high scale? Miss, we also have a connecting question as well. Uh, I, I'm Vatsala Varma from Loreto House, and um, I, I just noticed it's, uh, I mean, I read up somewhere that Sweden imports about 8 lakh tons of trash uh, uh, in order to power its waste to energy program. And uh, it, it, it has also made it mandatory for all uh, households to segregate the trash. So can India not take an example from countries like this? Can all countries not take an example from uh, Sweden and uh, reduce uh, overall? Hello, ma'am. My name is Sriparna Ghosh from Holy Child Institute. Ma'am, uh, in this year, 2016, the uh, summer has been started from the uh, month March. So my question is that, uh, will the time come when the winter doesn't come in India? Will <laughs> <laughs> you, who's going to let me ask for volunteers? So the first question was on two less. First was on two less, the issue about the poor are responsible for pollution. So why don't we first get them um, solar lights and lamps. Who would like to take that up? You can take that. Okay, okay I, I don't exactly know why I'm up here. Um, I'll take that question because I don't know if I can answer any of the other questions. Um, the question was, the question was, um, you know, should we get, should we help the poor since the, the poor are helping, are, are causing a lot of the pollution? That's the question, correct? I'm going to try. Are the poor responsible for pollution? Right. Okay. Yes. Okay, absolutely. He's going to get that from me, and then you're going to have to fill me out. Yeah, yeah, we'll see how we go. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with Indian policy uh, in, in depth and detail, so I don't exactly know. I know that there are present in this room good projects working on this to help the poor. Um, overall, I, I, while there is pollution from, caused by what's going on in rural areas, there's also a lot of pollution coming from cities um, all over the world, and I'm sure in this country as well, from what I've seen. And so, I would advocate, I don't know if that's the case of everybody, you know, the, the, the full opinion represented in the room or up here, but I would advocate that we need multiple levels. That in order to really see breakthrough on these things, the work that's being done to help the poor should be encouraged. Laws and regulations done to deal with larger corporations, factories, cars, that sort of thing. It's all necessary is probably the main point I would make. Um, I think very often the way I hear people talk, it's, well, we need the government to make a law here. We need them to do that. We're all a part of the solution. And so in answering that, and you know, whether it's people in rural situation or people in the cities, uh, the rich or the poor, every, everybody needs to be addressed in this way. Um, and as I said, there's some really good projects in the room that are working on that um, in rural settings. Um, 
and I'm sure there's a lot more that the government's doing here, or perhaps could be doing, um, to answer in the in more of the urban environments. Well, uh, I think that the two parts of the question are not necessarily need to be linked. Uh, I don't agree that uh, poorest of the poor are the biggest polluters. I don't agree with that. And but at the same time, I completely agree that solar needs to be taken to the doors of poorest of the poor. Those two. This is not for this that. Uh, for the first part, if you look at the pollution profile of the country, for that matter, the cities, you will find that uh, perhaps the poorest of the poor are most visible, kind of contributing to pollution. But the richest of the rich, they contribute much more. Look at the industries. Industrial pollution are the biggest part in the whole pie. So uh, I think it's not, it's not correct to say uh, that poorest of the poor contribute most to the pollution. But having said that, I also think that solar needs to be taken to the doors of the poorest of the poor. Uh, we know, we all know that how the poor people are being affected by indoor pollution. There's a huge figure. If you look at the figure that how many people die every year due to indoor pollution and how that contributes is a huge thing. And I am reminded by a particular project of Dr. Gonchodri some days back, which I was a part of in some way or other, in a, in a, in a slum in Kolkata, in, in southern part, uh, he had made an innovative kind of structure which comes through the uh, roof which concentrates the solar energy and converts it kind of a lamp. So it's a lamp without a lamp, and that has been brought to the doors of solar, I think about 200 households, uh, Dr. Gonjodhari, 200 households. Another 500 are on the uh, kind of, uh, there will be done shortly. So that kind of changed the profile. Previously, when he, we used to talk about solar, we used to only think about putting solar in a, in a kind of a larger format, in a middle class format to rich class format. But now I think with this kind of innovation, uh, solar uh, has been come, kind of come closure to the poor people. They are getting the benefits of solar and it should be continued in much more stronger manner. But that is to be done independently, not necessarily. And I, as I said, I don't agree with that. Who is the most polluters? Uh, no, that's a good question, uh, but only one point, since the students are here, has been mentioned, you know the per capita energy consumption of poor people is much less than the rich people. So poor people, they emit less, their emission level is always less. I, I give you a small example. In Calcutta, per capita energy consumption is about 2,000 kilowatt hours. Whereas in Sundarban, it is only 86. So you can think who is producing it. So that is the answer. Okay. Next point is your what are the other sources? Solar is a very popular source out of many renewable energy sources. Solar is you know, really a popular energy source. But as you have mentioned, someone is mentioning about waste to energy project or you know energy efficiency. We are not discussing. That is also a good way of energy conservation and reducing emission. Waste to energy project in internationally, you know, their garbage quality is very rich. But here we have tried a lot throughout the country. But our energy to uh, waste to energy projects are not very successful. Even in Bhapa we have tried. So we are trying to do some new technology, new, new type of things, you know, to utilize the garbage. But now there are approaches, you know, to use the kitchen waste, market waste, where you have a lot of uh, biodegradable waste. And from that, we are directly through biomethanation, we are generating gas and using for energy generation. So that technology, I'm sure within five years time, you'll find in solar water heater, thermal, and solar photovoltaic, and the waste to energy projects, you will not find wind or micro hydro or any other energy sources because we don't have resources. So someone was asking in cities, Cities, there are two most important alternative energy resources. One is solar, both photovoltaic and thermal. 
and second one is president of India. On which yes, government of India, state government and people are they are one. Next question is about air pollution, the odd and even policy that came in in Delhi. What else can happen? Would you like to take that? Yeah, thank you very much. I think, um, as you rightly said, I mean, one, one problem was this pollution through, through these diesel cars, and it's quite surprising to see that indeed they pollute much more. But you, you don't buy the usual petrol cars very often. I mean, if you look for a certain size of car, it's only diesel cars, at least in, in Delhi. So, um, as it was also mentioned, I mean, it's not the only topic. I mean, there are many more reasons. I think it was mentioned the usual emissions from industries, the use of coal power plants without proper filters, the burning of uh, crop leftovers, but also some weather conditions, which makes it really difficult. I mean, lack of wind and, and, and haze. So basically, um, what would be probably interesting, because this odd even will come back at least in Delhi, but Delhi is not the only city which is... Uh, really harshly polluted. I mean, you can go to, to Raipu, you can go to Patna. I mean, several cities are on the, on, the, on the top 10 or top 50 list of polluted cities in the world, uh, ranked by the World Health Organization. So probably, and this is something we want to actually um, push as well from UNICEF's side, we want to team up with the Ministry for, for, for Public Health. I know the name is a different. Um, to, to debate this question in all depth, because it needs a quite complex strategy actually to address this one. It has been done, um, it has been done just recently in, in Mongolia, where they have in the capital a similar situation. It's not as bad as in Delhi, but indeed they teamed up together and let's, let's have a public debate and let's have a lot of youth and children participate as well. Because, and there maybe I want to come back to what you said earlier, Indeed, um, from our side, I mean, this conference, climate conference, for example, it was more seen as a, as a positive thing, yeah? Actually, what we have to do, we did not achieve to do something binding, but we have all you, and we have to meet much more often like we are here, to put power and to put this accountability to it. And that's the same story for the air pollution. So let's, let's get together and let's debate it. Let's debate it in Kolkata, where the air is a bit better, and let's debate it in Delhi. Okay, I'm responsible for asking for the odd and even policy in Delhi. Okay, so my organization is. So I should ask you firstly, if um, we get the odd and even policy going in Kolkata, how many of you will want to get your parents to follow it? Bas, it nahi. Saaf hawa nahi chahiye kisi ko bhi. Why don't you like odd and even? Why? So, it will have half the cars on the road. It's not the poor, it's the rich who drive. Don't use the poor as an excuse. How many of Kolkata people drive a car? Do you know? Do you know that? No, no, rich is not very rich. But rich means rich. In Kolkata, less than 10% people drive a car. Less than 10%. Okay? In Delhi, it's 15%. So don't use the poor as an excuse. In fact, the chief minister of Delhi is bringing odd and even back because he realizes that when odd and even happens, the buses move very fast. Because without the cars on the road, the buses move very fast. And the poor actually take a bus. So don't use the poor as an excuse, okay? <laughs> oh, my Cooper. Cooper, Cooper, Cooper. Uh, the buses are not uh, petrol based, right? They are all, all sorts of diesel. Good question. That is diesel. now a very sensitive. So why can I agree? And that's where the problem is. In Delhi, we are better because our buses are run on compressed natural gas, CNG. Kolkata does not have CNG, so you have a problem with it. But remember that if you can get a Euro 4 bus, your problem is that you have really buses which are not worth calling a bus. Okay? They're a truck. Okay? They just look like a bus. Okay? 
So if you're going to so get a modern efficient bus, uh, it will be more uh, polluting uh, than uh, because uh, it's uh, diesel, uh, but still uh, it'll carry uh, many uh, more uh, people. Uh, a bus uh, per kilometer, uh, bus does 200 kilometers uh, a day, uh, carries uh, 200 uh, people uh, in one uh, bus. Uh, so just uh, think uh, about the load per person. A car does 50 kilometers a day, carries one person. The best thing with odd and even in Delhi was all of us carpooled. All of us had to find a way to make car travel more efficient. So what is wrong with it? Why would you fight it? What is the use of Bharat stage norms then? Bharat stage norms will be improve air quality, but we've already got Bharat stage four in Kolkata and Delhi. The problem with the better norms is you can have better norms which are 10 times better than the last norms, but then you add 10 times more vehicles. Do the maths. The numbers are the same. So that's the big problem. Therefore, we have to find answers. And I would agree with you if you were to say, and you should say it very loudly, put the mic in front of you and scream and say, I want odd and even, but I want it with a really good public transport system. Say that. I want the odd and even policy to run all over the India, uh, all over the nation, but with a very good uh, public, public transport, transport policy. System. Would you all agree with that? Good. Thank you, ma'am. That's the answer. Yes, Kansan. I, I just would like to kind of uh, add a few words which Sunita has just said. That it's a fact that our public transport in Calcutta, which has been traditionally, I think, one of the better public transport for the country, is on a very level. And uh, there is public lack of public transport. But just say you'd like to use this platform to raise a question to all of you students. What has happened to Calcutta tram? Calcutta's tramway system is one of the better tramway systems throughout the world. It is the only city where the tramways has been continuing for so long, apart from Melbourne, outside Europe. And when the tram is coming back, it has come back all over the world. And is part of the, is a, is a cog in the whole wheel. It's a very important cog in the whole wheel. We are kind of, we are kind of ensuring the tram is going to have a slow death. But few people who have been fighting for the tramways in Kolkata, I haven't heard anybody actually being, saying anything. So, but in spite of everything, we are talking so much in, in large vein about the Calcutta's metro. Calcutta metro, as of now, carries 5% of the road traffic. Trams still carry 2%. LRT. <laughs> so, a smart packaging. The metro. If you go underground, it's much more expensive. Uh, it's, it's cheaper than when you go. No, overground is cheaper. Underground is much more expensive. 